Hey guys, welcome back. So today I want to take you guys along for a little planty project. In last week's video, I mentioned I wanted to take all the plants off of the open shelving here, give them a good clean and kind of restyle things and refresh these shelves for spring. Over the winter, the plants have honestly grown a lot more than I expected them to and the shelves just look a little bit messy. I thought about doing the entire room, like including my tent, including my exos, but I'm going to set my expectations um, realistically and I think we're only going to get through this shelf and behind me when I was watching back the footage of my last week's video which is like the kind of plant tour thing I was like the, the plants were they're kind of covered in like dead predatory mites and it just looks really dirty and I just want to get that tackle today I want to where's my spray bottle I also want to get the majority of the leaves sprayed down with um, this is basically straight 99% alcohol not diluted but with um, Castile soap tea tree and peppermint added in so all hardened leaves are going to get a nice spray down I'm honestly probably going to be chopping a lot of leaves off that are either like have pest damage on them are kind of crisping and dying and just kind of make some more space because it's getting a little crowded and I just want to do things at my own pace and be very chilled out. I just wanna work with my hands and I just thought I'd take you along with me. Hopefully this is a sign for you to also do the same for your plant shelf and we kind of do it together. Usually when I do this kind of thing, like I have earphones in and I just like pull plants down and I just give them the individual kind of touching up and judging that they need. So I might take cuttings at this time. And once I get every plant down, I'm gonna clean all the shelves with um, probably I'm probably just gonna use pine saw in case there are like any pests that are just like living on the shelf I was just willing myself to have the motivation to do this because sometimes I just like don't want to do it I have to be in the right mood and then I got a message from Amanda that she went on one of her chopping sprees where she chops all the leaves off she sent out this photo of her like empty plant shelf and I was just like yes that is the motivation I need I want to do it too so by the end of this i want to have this shelf kind of like just styled the way i want to the back shelf probably won't have as many changes but there will be some changes and this won't be the entire um, project finished i have something coming in the next week or two that's going to kind of complete the project but this is going to be the meat of it but i'm thinking it probably makes the most sense to start with this shelf because it's the most overdue this is the dusty dead mites that I'm talking about. I don't think these are predatory mites. I think they're the feeder mites that come in with the predatory mites and I don't see them moving anymore. So, but this one is like one of my kind of, I don't know, it's like a forgetty eye that was really green and it doesn't have a ton of silver, but it's pretty dark, especially under mother lights. It turned really dark. Um, I'm gonna cut off this leaf. This one also needs some water. I repotted this probably around Christmas time and it's really taken to tree fern soil. And the funny thing is, I don't know how this happened again, but this thing got pollinated and I didn't do that. But it looks like it was like uh, pollinated all along the whole inflorescence. Like I see berry formation all the way from here to the tip. And, I, and I'm certain I didn't do it. I don't know if forgetty eyes tend to self easily. But I certainly didn't do that and I didn't put uh, an organza bag on it because I wasn't really expecting it and I don't have enough organza bags to do my entire collection. But yeah, I'm curious to see what these ones look like. If you guys will remember, this happened to another one of my forget eyes. And to be honest, I it's either, I'm pretty sure this is just like forget eyes and forget eyes so, like breeding with each other. This is the tray of plants that I got off of the last like accidental breeding of forget eye. And I'm pretty sure they can be potted up in their own pots soon because there's like two or three in some of these this is probably the bigger one and it's showing silver it looks a lot like its mom which is also not looking great but this is the mom that it came off of so it happened again <laughs> this new leaf that just came in has a little bit of mechanical damage and a slight amount of spider mite damage just like right here but it's like such a cool like super black but the veins are really green like, I don't really have any forgetty eyes like this. I'm just gonna give you a little spray down. Not the new leaf, because this this will burn your emergent leaves. It will just turn into, like, brown crisp. But in my experience, it's totally fine for hardened leaves. One thing if you're dealing with pests is, like, chopping off the leaves, honestly, will make pest treatment if you're actually dealing with a huge outbreak. Cutting all but, like, one leaf off of all your plants will honestly help it 
be easier to maintain. And that's why I love Anthurium so much because if I cut all but this one leaf off, this new leaf, it will still look fine. I could very easily just cut these two off if I was dealing with a really massive outbreak. I'll give you some water. I'm just doing a TPS1 fertilizer today. Probably the next uh, watering I do, we'll do, we'll do CalMeg. And then since I'm moving a bunch of plants around, I'm not gonna leave a reservoir, but when I get it back onto the shelf, I'm gonna add a little bit of water to the tray because it's sitting in LECA and there's roots down here and the LECA just doesn't get as moistened as um, the rest of the substrate. So I'm just gonna like just add a little bit here. This one is another Forgetii hybrid. I don't know what the parents are, but I just know there's Forgetii. I'm gonna just cut off the smaller leaves that will just make a lot more space. And this leaf is pretty much fully hardened. It will be a good test to see if like, if it's not like 100% fully hardened for like more than a month, will it still burn with alcohol? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna test it. There she is all clean. She also needs water. These plants are drinking so fast. Even though this pot is pretty massive, I've been watering this more than once a week. I'm also gonna be throwing out my little mite packets now because they've done their work. I'm pretty sure there's no juice left. My alocasia scalperum is still in flowering mode, although it is finally gonna be pushing a leaf. <laughs> finally. The roots have been happy in pond. This was transitioned from soil to pond. Um, I think I'm just gonna wipe it off. No, nothing to cut off. I don't cut off flowers. I always just let them die off on their own. Oh my gosh, there's spider mites. When I sprayed it, you can see right in the sinus. I don't know if you can see. There's webbing right here. Mother fricker. Of course it's on the alopecia. I'm just really hoping because this leaf is so textured, it's not going to leave that like kind of powdery white residue on the leaf once it's dried. So far it's not, it's looking good. I just want a big scalp rum, is that so much to ask? And for good measure, I'm just gonna spray the inflows. Okay, there she is, all done. Give her a little water. A lot of water. Ooh, she was pretty dry. Do you guys have this plant? This is um, from Tropicals. This is their Anthurium Crystallinum Silver Special. I like this so much, but this thing is kind of a biatch. I was having a lot of this stuff, which I'm gonna chop off, but this kept happening when it was in pond. And I just, I am convinced that this thing is kind of Warakwainum level, hates drying out. If you let it dry out one bit, it's gonna start dropping that leaf almost immediately. Luckily, it seems to be doing okay in ambient conditions, but like this one, do not ever let it dry out. If you kind of crack the code on like sizing this one up, let me know, cause I really like this plant. This one has predatory mites all over it, but it doesn't look like any spider mite damage. Okay, that one is done. Not a pretty plant. I always have trouble finding a spot for plants like this that aren't like really pretty yet. Cause I just kind of want to shove them in the back and let them like kind of figure stuff out. But then like when I neglect a plant is usually when it gets hit with pests and they don't end up beautifying. What would be ideal is if I had like a tent that was like a small, um, like, like two by two tent that is only for rehabbing like ugly plants and beautifying them and it had like optimal conditions. That would, that would be ideal, but I don't have the space for that. I totally forgot to show this plant in my uh, philodendron collection video, but I still have my UPI. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> this thing, I don't know if I can grow it. Why? Why? Simply why? I wanted this, this was like such a top wish list plant for me, but how am I supposed to deal with this kind of growth pattern? Despite all of the leaves facing like one side of the plant, cause like if I put a pole here, all the leaves are that way, but must you grow like this? It's just uncalled for. This one is also covered in EFN. They're all over the petioles. 
I honestly think this is going to be on the chopping block. I'm just gonna alcohol you. I should also mention that like the secondary um, goal of today is to purge some plants. I have a few in mind and this might honestly be one of them. But since these have been tissue cultured, I just don't know if anyone's actually looking for one. I might sell this plant, but she does need water. So we'll give her some water and I'm gonna put her in like the sales pile over there. This is the second leaf grown in ambient conditions. Do you have spider mites? No. And I nicked the bottom by accident and so it got damaged and it didn't grow very well. I have such a hard time with luxurians. And I've only ever grown my luxurians in either moss or pond. And it definitely likes pond more than moss, but I honestly feel like I want to get this into soil or tree fern soil. Actually, why am I clean? I'm just gonna chop. I'm gonna chop this guy off. I just feel like because luxurians and luxurians hybrids, they get really bad edema. And when they get edema, they tend to like cause a lot of damage on the leaves. So you'll see like it really see through on the margins and then it'll start to yellow if you get it like inconsistently watered. They're just not as forgiving of inconsistency as some other anthuriums. So I honestly feel like if I get it into tree fern soil, it will maintain like, there will be less fluctuation in the amount of moisture in the substrate. All right, so this one is clean. Look at this new leaf on my polypodioides. It's so big. Isn't that nice? I'm very proud of you. You have some speckles. Is this spider mites? Mm, it doesn't seem like spider mites. This one did get predatory mites on it. Okay, this one is really delicate, so I'm gonna have to like very gently wipe it down. This one could probably do with a shower, to be honest. I just don't really want to take you into my bathroom. Not that there's anything wrong with my bathroom. It's clean, it's clean bathroom, I promise, but it just feels weird filming in my bathroom. I'm trying my best not to rip any of these leaves because they're very delicate. I'm just, yeah, like I think this one probably should grow not on the shelf because it's getting a little bit tall. And since the pole gets really close to the shelf above it, I find it really hard to water this moss pole. It's not even a moss pole, it's a tree fern fiber pole. Ooh, there's a good amount of action in there. This pole needs a water. I'm gonna probably grow this somewhere else. Not sure where, but I'm gonna create an area over there for plants that are moving out. I just wanna show you this leaf one more time. It's gotten so, it's gotten so mature. Okay, this next one is going to be chopped back severely. So this one is um, Amanda's hybrid. This is Philodendron Scott Marianum crossed with Bet Waterberry or 69686. And when I moved it out of the EXO that I was growing in, like high humidity EXO out here, it started to produce like so much EFN. Look at all of that. That's all EFN. And it just burns through the leaves. Um, but I've been noticing with the last couple of leaves, this one was a leaf before. There's still a lot of EFN, but not nearly as much as this one. I'm gonna chop every leaf off because they're so, so damaged from EFN. And I'm gonna leave this nice new leaf on. Kind of reposition this on my little stake. And yeah, there you go. It's just a single leaf for now. My fingers are so sticky. This thing also dries out really fast. I think just because this like shelf gets so much light from all the barinas, and I usually have mother lights, they're, they're usually here. I've turned them off for, for filming. The plants just need water like every five days. And Therium when lingeri. The new inflow is starting to curl. This one is also starting to curl. What I really like about Wenli inflows is that the spadix always points downwards. So you don't have like, um, you know how like inflows always seem to find the light and they always seem to burn themselves because they just go right up against the grow light and then you reposition them so they're not touching the grow light. And the next day you find them touching the grow light again. Wenlies don't do that. The last time it flowered, I did pollinate it with Wenli pollen and it didn't take. And I'm not sure if it was because one day I found spider mite webbing just on the inflow, not on leaves, nowhere else. So I treated the inflow for pests and I'm not sure if that killed the inflow or not. So I'm gonna be very careful because I'm going to pollinate this again when it's ready. So today, as I'm filming this, it's 
spring equinox. So it's officially the first day of spring. I know a lot of people find life in general, but especially plant care, really unmotivating in the winter because things don't really grow and just the energy levels are low to begin with. Are you feeling like things are coming back? I kind of have the inverse of what a lot of people have in terms of seasonal depression. So I am the happiest in fall winter and I'm the saddest in summer. Spring, spring is nice. I really like spring, but then spring, there's always this like ominous feeling like summer's coming. I really, really, really don't like summer. And it just makes me, it makes me anxious to be honest. And I just like hate the feeling of like hot and it makes me feel really claustrophobic. So I'm wondering how you guys are feeling now that spring is officially here. Are you feeling like you're coming out of your little mental cocoon? This one I'm gonna pull. This one is going to be shipped next week. So I'm gonna bring it to the shop so Lauren can get it, um, like all the phytosanitary inspections done. This one's gonna go to the States and it's going to Amanda and I'm so excited, but this one does not have any pest damage, but I will spray it. But she does isolate everything. Amanda is very, very, very cautious about pests. So I have no doubt that she's going to isolate this when she gets it. And I also have to repot it because this might be too large of a pot to ship in. But I'm gonna put this to the side and I'll bring it down. Oh, you're so cute. Charmaine just got back from California last night and she has all my new plants. I had I ordered a couple plants to be shipped to her while she was gone and she has some plants from Amanda too and I'm really excited to see them. Let this be your sign to upsize the pots on your anthuriums. This is my Vag Lux from Lauren. I've explained who Vag is so many times, but the leaves were like this size for a couple of leaves in a row. And it was growing in a little 16 ounce coffee cup and I moved it to this pot and then boom, look at that. This leaf is still a little soft, so I won't be spraying it because it will get damaged, but I'm gonna spray all the other leaves. So lately I've been like really in my head, um, not in a bad way, in just like I'm every spare moment when I'm doing something, I'm always just like thinking the wheels are turning. Um, I, I don't know why, but I've been realizing it's been like maybe a month of me being a, in a very pensive mood. The whole month I've just kind of been ruminating on the idea of joy versus pleasure versus happiness how they relate to each other, where do they overlap, are they different, and where are they different, what differentiates them, and I have a lot of like feelings, <laughs> feelings and thoughts that I just feel like I need to get out there in the universe so I can kind of maybe get something back in terms of an answer or perspective, but it all kind of started when I was, I was listening to Call Her Daddy. It was just randomly one of those house chore days when I had like my earphones in and just rolled on to this one episode that I probably wouldn't have chosen which actually feels like very happenstance that I came across this episode because it kind of snowballed into me thinking about a lot of other things and looking at other things differently that I feel like has really changed my mindset and I also feel like it kind of coincides with this changing of seasons from winter to spring but the episode was it, it's it sounds so weird and random, but the episode was called Cancel Diet Culture. And the whole episode was about like changing the way we think about dieting, our relationship with food and pleasure that we get from food and stuff like that wasn't normally, I wouldn't gravitate towards a podcast like that because I don't really diet or I guess I don't think that I diet. I should probably be more concerned about what I'm putting into my body, but I'm not that concerned and I'm not trying to change the way I eat. I eat for pleasure. So I don't even think I listened to that entire episode, but there was a guest on there and I don't even know what her, her profession is, but it, she has clients that I guess she coaches them through like having better relationships with food or something. One thing that really stuck with me with what she said is that as humans, we're hardwired to find pleasure all the time. And when we don't get it all throughout the day, because we have priorities that stop us from feeling pleasure, work, like we're really busy. And then at the end of the day, we are so, so deprived and our brain is just like desperately looking for some sort of sustenance, first of all, and pleasure and instant gratification. So we go towards the most accessible and usually junky food. But the part that stuck with me the most is that like the the 
recommendation was to program in or like kind of bake in moments of pleasure throughout your day that aren't all food. So other feelings of pleasure, which should end up making us feel more fulfilled and sustained throughout the day and not feeling like we're just like starving, starving in many senses of the word by the end of the day after we finish our duties. I should probably grab a plant while I talk about this. And it also got me thinking about like my past and how I am and how a lot of other millennials can be. I really love my generation. But one thing about a lot of us is that we have this like hustle mentality and it's almost like if you're having a good time, you're not working hard enough. And there's also like a lot of shame around resting. Um, I've been guilty of that too. Like I used to work with a lot of millennials. It's almost like a badge of honor to be like suffering all throughout your day and like, oh, I didn't even take a break today. Or if someone's like taking a vacation and then they're taking a vacation again, like a few months later, you're like, didn't you just take a vacation? Another thing about a lot of millennials is that you feel the need to take care of other people's needs before you address your own. So then you are kind of left in the dust. So like I used to just make sure that everyone had their lunch breaks, make everyone had everything they need, all the rest time, had the like kind of rotations of tasks and stuff to make them fresh. And I just kind of fill in the gaps of what is left over. And you guys have commented that like compared to when I first started YouTube, which is when I was like very unhappy in my old job, how different it feels now. And I do feel like I am happier and I do feel like I've been gradually kind of becoming happier with this new life of not working for my old employer. But in the back of my mind, I'm also like, is this, is this going to be permanent? Like, when is this all going to be taken away from me? But anyway, um, I was just like kind of sitting on this podcast thoughts for a couple of days. And then I just like brought it up with my boyfriend and we're talking about like, how can we change the way we think about how we structure our day to make sure that we have these little snippets throughout the day. And it's not just eating what we like, but that should be part of it because we love food. What are those other things that can break up our day to make it less like a marathon and make us mentally more engaged and just happy to be where we are? So yeah, that's kind of like what started the whole thing. So that made me start looking at my whole life a little bit differently. How do I structure my day so I don't end the day just running on fumes? And like, what other things can I be engaging with that will bring me joy and recharge me on the weekends? And enter sourdough bread. Um, I Some of you guys are probably like, shut up about sourdough bread. I can't. I just, I just, just let me say this. I used to have a sourdough starter. My mom gave me some of her starter at the start of the pandemic, like everybody else. And I just kept this thing alive-ish, not even really, healthy starter I had this like recurring reminder on my phone to feed it every three days not knowing that like it doesn't need to be fed every three days if it's living in a fridge not knowing how much to feed it in relation to how much is left in the jar I didn't know any of that didn't even research it so then after a couple of years went by I was like I was also missing a lot of feedings I wasn't feeding it actually every three days but I was like screw this I'm never gonna make a loaf of bread bread to me was like the holy grail of baking. I was like, there's no way, if, if it's too daunting, I'm not gonna do it. So I just chucked that starter away. And then I was starter free for a few years, couple of years at least. And then one day, Jesse, our friend Jesse, I've mentioned him a lot of times, he baked sourdough and he just brought in four starters. Just like, it's free for all, whoever wants one, take one. So I was like, I'm gonna take one. I put it in my fridge, I did nothing with it. Didn't feed it for like probably two to three weeks. And then um, Jesse sent me this recipe or the YouTube video by Ben Starr. If, so if you do sourdough baking, you might've seen his channel before, but he basically has like a very ultra simplified sourdough thing. So I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna start with because it's harder to mess up. And the idea is that you put a starving like deflated, hasn't been fed in weeks, sour, uh, sourdough starter, and you use that as the base of your bread, but you use the leavening time, that's when the starter starts to wake up. Anyways, I'm not gonna go through the whole process, but that resulted in this bread, and I was 
so in awe that this came out of my oven and it was a joy that I cannot explain. And I've baked four loaves since then. Each time it does not get old. I have so much joy when I open up the Dutch oven and I just see that first rise in the steam coming out and just see how much oven spring is on that loaf. So much joy when I finally take it out um, and then like let it cool and I cut into it and just eat that warm. It's like not warm warm, but it's like not fully room temperature yet. It's warm enough to kind of soften butter, you know? And I just chew on that crust in my kitchen. And I can't really explain what I'm feeling other than just pure joy. Like the, all my senses are going off, my nose, my taste buds. There's some feeling in here of like a lot of satisfaction and, and I guess pride that I baked something so delicious and so simple. So yeah, like the sourdough thing really started to like snowball this this concept, this amorphous concept of pleasure and joy that I had started like thinking about. And then, okay, sourdough, yep, yep. And then I started to like read on, like I was reading the Tartine, uh, what's it called? The Tartine Bakery, the, the their bread book. And something about that also felt like really just grounding. Um, and I just started to realize, I'm sorry, I should be, <laughs> I should be doing plan stuff. I started to realize that like, um, I was finding things that were making me feel more connected to my life. And by, by my life, I don't mean my work life, I just mean my life. Like my life to myself, not to myself, like with my family, but not, not relating to work. And life is not perfect. There's so many things stressing me out, but like, can I redesign my life to nourish me where I need the nourishment? And, and it ha doesn't have to be every day, it doesn't have to be every minute of every day, just feeling like, oh, so good. Like everything feels so good. I don't want that, but I want parts of my life to be in contrast to the stresses and like the sad parts, the mundane parts. So, th so there's that. <laughs> Sourdough has, is starting to change my life, to be honest. Are you, you're not gonna fit on this shelf. Okay, good to know. And then something else happened. I never start TV shows when they're like fresh and new. I always, I'm always late, right? Like the, this, it was the same with Game of Thrones. This one's not so bad, but we started to watch The Bear. Have you guys seen The Bear? I was able to watch it on Disney Plus. I don't know where else it's streaming, um, but it's on Disney Plus for sure. Thank you to Charmaine for letting me use your Disney Plus account. The only reason why we started watching that show is because we were we were on Netflix. I was using my sister's Netflix account and it kicked me out because it realized I wasn't in her house. Um, and we were watching Blown Away, which I do enjoy that show. It's that glass blowing show. So yeah, we were watching that, got kicked out, started looking for something else to watch. And then we were on Disney Plus and he's like, what's the bear? And I was like, I've heard that it's good. I've heard that for people in like the food service industry, it's like a lot of relatable stuff. So let's give it a try. <laughs> I fell so madly in love with that show. We've finished both seasons now and I'm I'm definitely 100% going to be re-watching it. Not, maybe not the whole, well, why not? I'm just, I'll just watch the whole thing again. But there's one episode that I loved so much. It made me feel so emotional and so much like joy, frustration, hope. And I'm hopefully not gonna be spoiling anything for everyone, but if you don't wanna hear anything resembling a spoiler, this is the timestamp. You should watch The Bear if you haven't watched it already, especially if you ever worked in a restaurant or work in a restaurant, coffee shop, anything. But yeah, the, the episode that just had me, like I, I watched the whole thing with just a lump in my throat. I was, if my boyfriend wasn't there, I would be, I, I'd have tears streaming down my face. And it wasn't even a sad episode. So it's the episode, I forget what it was called. I don't even know what it's called, but it's the episode in season two where Richie goes for a stage at Chef Terry's restaurant. And it was the episode directly after a very painful, chaotic episode. It was the Christmas episode. But then I was watching this just like, it was to me a masterpiece. I don't know, I was feeling really emotional just watching it and I'm trying to figure out why. So if you watch The Bear, <laughs> here are my thoughts about it, please. Fast forward if you haven't watched it because I'm going to be spoiling some stuff. So like Richie 
in this whole sh show so far has been searching for purpose being told that he's a loser he has no worth his his kid doesn't respect him he's just he's good for nothing and then he gets sent for a stage which he, he assumes is to make him look stupid in front of like this world-renowned restaurant this very cold looking restaurant that looks very calculating no soul it's just about like precision and excellence but like there's just a lot of coldness behind it it's like very military like counting of seconds and everything has to be exactly just so and then the more he does it he's realizing that all of this is for the guest and it's to create an experience that just blows every expectation that they ever had and everything done for the guest is done for them as individual people and it's not done in a way where like I'm better than you you take this food as a masterpiece you appreciate it or get out it's like what can I do for you as a guest and it's executed with the utmost precision and no time is wasted and everything is like there's no limit to how how far you would go for that guest to feel just blown away by the whole thing and feel like the, everything was catered just for them and then so you're realizing this like very cold and calculating exterior of this restaurant is actually just like full of soul i'm going to try to get through this without crying hold on and richie realizes that what he's been doing this whole time for decades is what gives him purpose and he just had to do it in a certain way and be a lot more um invested in the execution of it and the the skill and the techniques and everything the thought behind serving guests and i honestly just felt like very seen tv shows and movies and stuff only ever focus on the chef because like they're the the master behind the food but then nobody has ever to my knowledge that i've seen at least kind of gone into detail on front of house and like the artistry behind creating a hospitable in my environment the conversation that they have in that episode talking about hospitality and stuff it was just beautiful i also think that anyone who works in hospitality in any capacity anyone who's had um interactions with a restaurant back of house front of house all need to watch that episode over the past couple of years i've been really thinking about like hospitality the industry and like is this like a bygone era are we ever going to recover from the pandemic but that episode really just hit me and i'm gonna have to watch it again and just kind of think about why it makes me so emotional but in a good way like i feel a lot of inspiration and i know joy is different for everyone and the experience of joy is going to look different for every single person and this is kind of mine um so if this little weird spiel could jumpstart someone to start thinking about their life in a different way to possibly start feeling happier feeling more pleasure and joy how these things are even different i'm still thinking about it um that would be good that would be nice um okay that was awkward here's the plant i'm gonna sell um this one is a very old plant i've had this for so long i'm gonna cut this leaf off because it has old spider mite damage the new leaf has like a bunch of mechanical damage it was like hitting the side of my exo but this is not spider mite damage it appears to be spider mite free and i can't um treat it because it's still a floppy leaf and it'll dry up but i'm gonna bring this to sell although if i bring this lauren's going to punch me in the face because it's such a big pot to ship so maybe i'll put it in the repot pile to get it potted into smaller maybe if it'll fit into a deli cup that will be ideal my politiforum which needs a repot remember when i snapped it and had no roots <laughs> it has too many roots again and i'm gonna get it out of here before it's like too compacted in this vessel because i'm gonna just snap it again i i might grow this down in my living room what am i hitting um because when i have too many strap leaf anthuriums in one spot it doesn't look good because they like drape over other plants there's just too many straps i just feel like it doesn't look super balanced so i have my wenli and i also want to move my my narrow form politiforum out here because it's getting too long for my exo so once both of them are here this one's gonna just look like it's like 
strap leaf overload. This um this Rio I chopped a couple months ago to propagate. So I had it in like a little plastic cup before and I knew it was getting really root bound and the leaves were getting kind of like light green like this. This wasn't nice and dark anymore. So I up potted it and honestly could go into a bigger pot. But the new leaves are looking a lot nicer in color. Like look at these ones down here. It's looking so much nicer now than this kind of pale, almost yellowy green up here. This was like very nutrient deficient, but I know some people have been looking for Rio, so I'm going to chop this. I'm going to take some cuttings because the trouble with my other cuttings is that the cuttings themselves, like the existing leaves, weren't very Rio looking, but these ones definitely look like Rio. I've been holding onto those props a long time because I wanted to make sure that the new leaves are very like Rio, like, like it's definitely a Rio before I sell it. That was three cuttings. Maybe I'll take one more because I'm hoping that will just trigger some growth up top too and just get some new leaves kind of forming up here. I think it still looks decently full like that. I'm going to just put this to the side because I'm not wiping each individual leaf down. So I'm going to spray it and then like rinse it down in my shower. I wish you guys could see how surrounded I am by plants. Look, I'm just sitting in a pile of plants right now. I'm just wiping down the shelves with pine sol now. I have these like glass shelf liners. These are the shelves that come with the mills bow and they get so dirty over time. But sometimes the fertilizer stuff doesn't come off. I have the same problem on my living room shelf, like the, the Ikea Vizjo. I have like fertilizer stains on there. It's just like crystallized, it won't come off. But you know how like before um, reptariums and stuff, cause you have to spray it with mineral water and they have like cleaners designed specifically for getting those mineral stains off. Maybe that could work, but this is kind of the best I can do with just pine salt, but it's better than nothing. I don't know if you can see from there, but the Mills bow, it kind of fits the depth of the shelf perfectly, but it doesn't go across the whole way. So only goes to about here and you have like maybe like this much distance of just like naked wire shelf, which is not so bad. It's just hard to put small little pots like directly on the naked wire shelf without a liner. Anyways, so I hope you guys are having a nice start to spring. Here in Vancouver, we had a bit of like a, like a spring teaser where it got really warm one weekend and everyone was out enjoying the sun. So many of my neighbors were doing gardening work, which I actually need to do after I finish filming. I need to like do a big yard cleanup and just tidy up dead winter stuff. But I think next week it's gonna get cold again. So not planting anything, but like I wanna restart my, my clover lawn again this year, but it's not time yet. I think it's one of those false starts. This one is not as stained as the other one. It's a lot cleaner. This is not the best angle, but it's what we got right now. A lot of these are gonna go back in the same spot, to be honest. my politiflorum, the new leaf. It has unfurled now and it's still super floppy, but look how long she's getting. I know the lighting looks terrible. Let me block it with my body. Can you see how beautiful she is? I think this will look so much better up here than the old one. And there's a yellow leaf I'm just gonna chop off. That's a nice big one too, but she's yellowing. I 
think I have it pretty good now. I'm pretty happy with the way this shelf is looking. So I'm going to quickly do this one. It's not going to be a lot of rearranging on this one, but I'm going to take the plants to the shower because they're bigger. I'm going to wash them off a little bit. And also my camera battery is starting to run out. So I'm going to do the shelf off camera and then I come back and show you like the final result for now, which will be good for like another three months. Okay, I'm back. That only took one podcast episode to get this shelf done. And we're done for today. For today. Like I said, I have, well, spoiler alert, it's a grow light. I have a grow light coming in, hopefully in a week or two. And we're going to light up this area a little bit more. But I'm pretty happy with how things turned out. Honestly, I'm mostly happy that the, the leaves are looking clean now. And um, let me just pick you up and show you what I've done. So this shelf here is just looking a little bit tidier. I probably lost like three or four plants from this shelf and cut off a whole bunch of leaves. Let me just show you this little pile of leaves that I cut off. And overall, just looking a little bit more like tidy. I turned my mother lights back on so you can kind of see the leaves a little bit better. But now there's just a little bit more room for spring growth and I just got nicer looking leaves, I guess, up at the front so I don't have to look at brown crisp. I'm still quite impressed with this little leaf jump on the Vagilux. And then down here, some plants got showered, some plants didn't. Just the plants that I could physically move out of here. Like this big Indomag guy, there's a big inflow here. It's all tangled up with the, um, what's that called? power supply power outlet tower <laughs> that I didn't really want to attempt trying to move it out one thing I want to do is kind of put a stake on and just get this leaf because it's so heavy it just sits really low so I just want to raise it a little bit but nothing too much is going to change this plant's not going to live here forever Charmaine's back so I'm going to return this to her but that's her um, Anthurium Brielle King of Spades moved up one level it's a little bit closer to the light. This plant can take quite a bit of light. You'll get more like vibrant reds and stuff. So it'll get light from mother, my mother light, and also the Barina's above. Um, Dark Forgetii is there. Dark Forgetii right now is acting like <laughs> a disguise for this ugly leaf. This is Maglux that I'm rehabbing. It's pushing a leaf right now. If it'll just focus, there's a leaf coming out. So once the Brielle goes back to Charmaine, then that one can kind of slide over. I don't know what's going on with my Queen of Hearts. It's yellowing. It's actively flowering. I don't know if you can see there's a flower poking out. So I'm just going to leave it. But honestly, I don't know what's going on with it. I think I was giving it way too much light before because it was like burning to a crisp under Monio Slice. It was getting quite close. It was sitting somewhere else before. So I moved it here to give it less light and we'll see. And this is another one of my little dark forgetty eyes. Feeling a lot better about this. Things are looking a little cleaner. Nothing too crazy, but I feel like with a lot less leaves in here, not a lot less, but just maybe like 10% less leaves, it's just easier to get pest management under control. And if 2024 can be the year that I eradicate spider mites, that would just be the best. But all in all, um, I could chop back a couple more leaves here and there to make room for more plants because I, the goal eventually is to move some plants out of here to make room for all the plants that I've got coming in from the States this week and in the next couple of weeks. But I'm just gonna take it one week at a time. I think with each year, since I've gone through several cycles of being super overwhelmed by my collection in comparison with my work schedule and how busy I am, I'm becoming a less um, precious about purging plants and I'm also less precious about just cutting things back to make room and I think it's easier for me to kind of see the warning signs of when I'm starting to resent certain parts of my collection because of how much stress they bring me so this year I'm going the more preventative route and right now I'm not overwhelmed by my collection at all actually so I'm feeling like we're in a good place and I'll do another video once the grow light comes in and we can kind of finish off this little area the goal would be to have a room that doesn't feel so dark. Like right now, the way I'm framed right now, it doesn't look so dark because I have a soft box here lighting me and I purposely keep my tent door open all the time when I'm filming. People ask me if I keep the tent door just open. I don't, it's just because of the lighting from the tent with the soft box, it kind of makes things a lot more even. But the goal is to just have it look even ideally because my house is so dark and there are so many girl lights i just like don't want to see so many dark spots especially in this room i just want like a nice 
glowing room if possible. So one step at a time. I feel good about today. I am going to go out in the garden now, do a big backyard cleanup, and I cannot wait to get out in the sun. It's nice and cold outside with like warm sun and you can be out there in a t-shirt. It feels really nice. But anyway, if you were cleaning your plant shelf and organizing while you were watching this, I hope you made good progress as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Mwah.